Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I'm going to be talking about uh, helium thermo or geochronology today. And uh, just before we start, uh, last year before GSA, um, Becky and I held a short course that was just about helium thermochronology. It, it was a it was a full day class that we did. Um, these slides will be available, but I'll also uh, either direct you to this address, this web address that you can get on these slides. You can email me about it. And what it is is a kind of a complete set of the materials that we used when teaching this class, including some exercises and a variety of other methods talks that we had. Um, I think like most everybody who's giving these methods talks, the decisions I had to make were more about what I wasn't going to talk about than what I, I am going to talk about. Uh, and so I necessarily had to leave out uh, some things that hopefully were covered there. Um, what I am going to be discussing then today, or uh, uh, kind of shown here, I'm going to talk about some of the fundamentals of the helium method, uh, primarily discussing helium production, give a, a short history of the technique development, because I, I personally think it's kind of fascinating, a little bit about the analytical methods, and then what I'm going to spend kind of a chunk of time on are what I consider to be some of the uh, special considerations that the helium method has to deal with that might not be uh, 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 things that other techniques necessarily have to deal with. I'll talk a little bit about interpreting helium dates, and then uh, finally finish off with some of the logistics of helium dating for those of you who might be considering doing uh, helium type projects. Um, so first about where we get the helium, we heard yesterday a fair amount about uranium lead geochronology, and uh, this is a, a version of the similar type of picture that we saw yesterday showing uh, in this case, the uranium-238 decay chain in a cartoony way, uh, with uranium-238 uh, decaying eventually to, to lead-206. But of course, uh, this involves a variety of steps. Um, the long arrows down to the left are alpha decays. The uh, short arrows up to the left are, are beta decays. But each one of these alpha decay events is, of course, when an alpha particle is ejected from whatever nucleus uh, it is you're, you happen to be at at the time. And an alpha particle is, is the same as a helium-4 nucleus. So it, it's ejected, it picks up an electron, and all of a sudden it's, it, it's a full-on, full-blown helium-4 atom. So you can see that during the decay of uranium-238, as it goes to lead-206, you're actually producing eight helium atoms. And so the he and uh, uranium-235 is similar. You produce seven. Thorium-232, uh, you produce six, going down to their eventual stable uh, lead products. So what that means is that uh, instead of thinking of uranium as the parent and lead as the daughter, what we do in the helium method is think of uranium or thorium as the parent and thorium and helium as the daughter product. And that's really the basis for, uh, for helium geochronology. So this is what you end up doing then. The helium that is in any particular crystal, uh, and we'll talk about that, is a function of the amount of uranium-238, 235, thorium-232 for the most part. Samarium also makes a difference, but we, we can kind of ignore it for these uh, purposes uh, as well. Uh, and then these are the same kind of uh, the function of the age equations that, that we've seen in, in almost all of these talks. But you can see the, the modification is that uh, we get eight of them out of every uranium-238, seven and, and six, respectively, out of, out of the other isotopes. Um, you will notice, though, that I'm not writing up an age equation for the helium system uh, because we are kind of unique in the way where we have one daughter product that has uh, three or four potential parents. Um, and there's no real paternity test for helium. And so what you have to do is actually uh, assume that the helium is coming from all of these things combined. And uh, we have a variety of ways that we can then solve for T, which is the age. Uh, but you know, it's not as straightforward as, as, as some other uh, systems. Um, you can also see one of the advantages of, of this system is that we actually get an order of magnitude increase in our daughters uh, with every decay chain for the most part. So you actually accumulate helium uh, pretty rapidly. Um, what that means, at least in, in, uh, in kind of routine analyses, uh, you, can, you can measure and calculate helium dates over a, uh, even to fairly young things. Uh, we uh, regularly in our lab at least go, you know, kind of Pliocene to Proterozoic in the types of helium dates that we, we, uh, we measure um, and, and, uh, on, on a variety of, of different materials. <coughs> So the helium dating was, is, the, is really the first radiometric dating technique. It was, uh, it was first proposed back in the early 1900s. Uh, Ernest Rutherford and R.J. Strutt did a lot of work on it. Um, and it's actually rather fascinating. The uh, people who worked on it originally 
uh, knew that there was some sort of a, a kind of something that they couldn't explain at the time, which is that they would calculate these dates. And actually, it's quite amazing. If you look at the early papers that Strutt published, the dates that he calculated actually are, are pretty reasonable. He recognized, though, that they were probably what he called minimum ages because he was concerned about something called helium leakage. And what that was, as you can imagine, helium, it's a tiny little atom. It doesn't bond to things. Uh, it escapes our atmosphere for the most part. And so keeping it contained inside of a crystal so that you can measure it is difficult. And the, the irreproducibility uh, or the, the, the dates that they would get that didn't make sense with other constraints that they felt more confident in led people to believe at the time that what was happening is that helium was leaking out of the crystals. It was largely something that they couldn't constrain. And therefore, the technique was pretty much unreliable. And especially then as other more reliable systems in, in their mind uh, kind of came online, the system was largely abandoned for most of the 20th century. There were a kind of scattered uh, attempts to use it to date things that had uh, a lot of uh, uh, initial or common lead in them or kind of in special circumstances. But it really wasn't uh, thought of in uh, uh, very highly, I suppose. Uh, for those of you who, who ever work in labs as well, uh, Strutt also published a lot of uh, sketches of what his lab apparatus looked like, and it's it's quite astounding if you uh, if you ever have the chance. It involved gallons of mercury and is, is quite quite amazing. Um, but really, what happened in the, kind of the the mid 1980s is that there was this this revival, and what happened is that Peter Zeitler uh, uh, and colleagues took a, a new look at this system using some of the methodologies that Kip talked about yesterday that had kind of become very common in the geo and thermochronology literature through argon and rubidium strontium geochronology and things like that. And, and what they, they basically did is said, this helium leakage isn't something that is unpredictable, but perhaps, maybe like argon, it's a thermally controlled process. It's something that we can predict, we can use to model dates, and we can use to actually understand the dates. And I'll kind of give a... Um, a, a cartoony version of what I mean by that next. <clears throat> so he proposed this in a short paper in 1987, and then really in the mid-90s, uh, Ken Farley, uh, a student of his, and then uh, some of their colleagues, uh, really laid the groundwork for the helium systems that we use today, understanding a variety of the kind of the fundamental problems and complications and, and opportunities that the helium system, uh, helium system has. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the, this idea of a, of, of a, that the retention of a daughter product is a function of, of temperature, it's thermally controlled, or this, this concept of a closure temperature uh, is kind of, in a cartoony way, which I'll tell you is wrong in, in a, towards the end of the talk, is something like this. Basically, that if you have some crystal, at high temperatures, the helium, there's so much motion in the crystal lattice and with the helium, the helium escapes easily, it comes into the atmosphere, escapes into space, does whatever. But at low temperatures, uh, uh, the, the crystal lattice is able to hold on to that helium. And so you can actually start to accumulate the daughter product, and you can calculate some sort of an age. So what you're actually dating then with some of these systems isn't when the crystal formed, usually, um, but instead the time at which it p crossed through some temperature where it got cold enough to hold on to its daughter product. And it was the, the kind of the recognition of this and the characterization of this uh, that was done in the 80s and 90s that has kind of allowed for this enormous explosion of helium dating uh, throughout the earth sciences in the last you know, 15, 20 years, something like that. Um, one of the reasons that helium dating has become so popular is because if you look at the temperatures that it's sensitive to, kind of the generic closure temperature, for the appetite system, this is just kind of a, a chart and it's probably wrong and needs to be adjusted in some of these places, and I apologize for that. But if you look at the temperature sensitivity of the appetite system, appetite uranium thermal helium system, it's on geologic time scales. So if you want to date processes on the kind of the million year, you know, kind of 500,000 to longer year time scales, um, it's probably one of the lowest temperature techniques that we have access to right now. So we can date things that are happening at low temperatures, which for geologists means things that happen uh, at relatively shallow levels in the crust. The technique has really exploded over the years. Uh, this is just a, a plot of the number of, of hits that you get in GeoRef if you type in uranium, thorium, helium, or some version of it. Here you see a few little spatterings here and there, and Peter Zeitler published this paper in 87, and then uh, Ken Farley's student uh, did a, a thesis, uh, and they published a lot of the kind of the fundamentals of the project, and, and this only goes up to 2012, I'm, I'm sure. I, I don't think it's... <laughs> I don't think you can project it up to 2020, but um, 
It, it's, it's now something that, you know, uh, every year at every meeting, there are, uh, there's a ton of work that people are doing, not just using the technique, but trying to understand uh, more about the fundamentals of the technique and, and develop more ways to kind of exploit uh, this decay chain. Um, I'm making these numbers up, but I'd guess that about 90% of all the helium dating is done on apatite. 9.9 um, something percent has uh, been done on zircon, and then uh, all of the other minerals that people have tried to use got uh, to fit into that 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 uh, the, the remaining part. So almost everything so far has been done using the accessory uh, phases apatite and zircon. But theoretically, anything that that contains uranium and thorium could be dated by the helium method. Uh, we work on this in our lab right now. Um, uh, on a, uh, using things like sphene and, and uh, uh, other phases. Um, this is a kind of an area of, of active research for the most part. But for the most part, uh, and for what most of you, if you're thinking about doing a helium study, my guess is that most of you are thinking of doing work on apatite and zircon. And the rest of my talk is going to kind of focus mainly on assuming that we're going to be working on these, these, uh, these, these fairly common phases. Um, and uh, to date, uh, the helium dating has been used to date a, a whole slew of geologic processes. Um, things as uh, uplift and exhumation, uh, landscape formation, carving of canyons, the forming of topography, uh, when things erupt and mineralize, uh, basin reheating and thermal histories, uh, weathering uh, chronology, meteorite thermal chronology, dating wildfires and the presence of wildfires. It's a very uh, diverse technique. Uh, in, in its applications. And uh, I know at this meeting, at least, there, if you, again, if you just go into the GSA meeting planner and type in uranium thorium helium, you'll find a whole slew of, of talks and posters where people are applying this to answer a lot of a uh, very uh, kind of uh, uh, a diverse range of geologic questions. And of course, this list is expanding all the time. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> What I'm going to talk about then is uh, 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 next are some of the nuts and bolts of how we measure the ages. Um, I'm going to just going to go ahead and say that I'm going to be describing something that I refer to as standard helium geochronology. Uh, and again, for most people, if you're thinking about doing a helium study, this is probably what you're thinking about. There are other methods like in situ uh, helium dating, um, as well as a variant of the method, uh, helium 4.3 dating. I won't be talking about those. If you want to talk about in situ things, Kip's here, and I, I recommend that before he leaves you, well, he, I guess you have to leave pretty soon, but um, there are labs working on this, but I'm going to be talking about standard dating where you're dating a, a whole single crystal, and uh, again, there's, there's more things that we could discuss. Um, helium dating is, is analogous in some ways to what, uh, to, to the potassium argon system that, uh, potassium argon dating that was discussed yesterday as well, and what I mean by that is that Helium is obviously a gas. Uranium, thorium, and samarium are not. And what that means is that you have to use at least two different machines to measure the quantities of these two things. You can't just put it on one machine and, uh, and measure everything. Um, either, yeah, you can't do that. Um, so you have to use these two different instruments, which is slightly a pain. So what I'm going to go through then is talk about how first, uh, the first step of dating, which is selecting and characterizing the grain that you want to date, Again, we, we typically do single crystal dating for most of our, uh, most of our work. Uh, we then measure the daughter product, which is the, which is the helium, and I'll show you how we do that. And then we have to use a separate device to measure the, parent, uh, the parents of the decay system, uranium, thorium, and samarium. And once we have the information from characterizing the grain, the amount of daughter product, the amount of parents, we can then calculate a date, and then we can spend uh, spend the rest of your graduate career trying to understand what these dates mean. <laughs> so uh, probably the, with the exception of interpreting your data, from an analytical point of view, the vast majority of the time that you spend doing helium dating is in this step. And we, um, uh, we assume students will show up with vials of appetite uh, if, they, if, they, if they come to work with us. It might look something like this under uh, these images are just from a binocular microscope that has a circular polarizer in it, um, which is what we use to do all of our picking. Um, so you take some batch of appetites like this, maybe tens of thousands of them that come out, and what you really need to do is you need to spend uh, a lot of time looking at them to try to find what we consider to be the perfect types of, of crystals. And for helium dating, 
You need crystals that are big, euhedral, and don't have inclusions in them. Um, and uh, as any, um, some of you have come to our lab and picked, and you know that that can, that can actually be a challenge. Um, and I'll explain why we, why we do that uh, uh, in, in a few more slides. But what you want to end up with is something like this. And these types of crystals are things that, uh, again, there's a scale bar down there. Um, we can date each individual one of these. And typically for a sample, when you come to our lab, our default is you're going to get about five dates per sample. Um, but uh, after, from a time point of view, this can take anywhere from uh, a few hours to a few days to, to whittle it down to this, um, just sitting there at, 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 at the scope. Uh, before we actually analyze them, though, we actually have to characterize the grains. And this actually moves beyond just noting that they are pretty and don't have inclusions and are relatively big. Um, we have to measure them as well, and we measure them in, in a couple dimensions, and I'll explain why in a few more slides. We don't get down to the tenth of an angstrom precision that our software thinks we do. Um, but uh, for the most part, we ha what we have to do is we have to measure the length and the width of these grains, uh, the fact that they're euhedral. So once you have a crystal that's perfect, that you like, that's big enough, um, the next stage is to actually load it into a platinum or niobium little tube. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to heat it up, heat the sample up with a laser to get all the helium out of it so we can measure it. And uh, our early attempts to just heat a sample directly, a crystal directly with a laser, uh, had some issues. And there are a variety of reasons people think we had issues. But regardless of those issues, we solved it, for the most part, by loading them into these little metal tubes. The scale bar there is a millimeter. Um, you can see a little appetite crystal. This is one of the tubes. You crimp the bottom, and there's the crystal sitting in it right there. You crimp the top, and you make this little, uh, this little uh, pillow uh, with your grain sitting in the middle. Uh, this allows us something we can hit with a laser that will heat up the sample evenly, uh, that won't actually melt the grain. You can retrieve the grains out of these if you want. Uh, but this is the, the first step. This is actually not too difficult. It looks finicky with your tiny little tweezers, but um, it's actually not too bad. Uh, we load them into, into a standard sample holder. Here we have, uh, in our current setup right now, we'll do 25 at a time. Uh, this is what these little packets look like. Just pop them in these little things. And this is the device that we measure all the helium on. Um, it's nowhere near as as uh, big as some of the systems we was it the um, ultra sims was the the one yesterday that uh, mega sims yeah which is um, and actually almost everything you're looking at here isn't mass spectrometer what it is is that uh, there's a laser under here the samples go under there that's what we use to heat up the sample all of this tube work here are simply just uh, tubes that are held under vacuum about a ten billionth of atmospheric pressure or so kind of standard for noble gas analysis. A variety of things that help clean up the gas to get rid of all the other stuff that's degassed. Um, and the mass spectrometer is actually hiding behind this thing. It's about the size of a two liter soda bottle. It's a s small little quadrupole mass spectrometer. Um, the helium that we get out of the system naturally is helium four. So uh, we also use isotope dilution. What we do is we, the helium four comes out of here, travels, expands into these tubes. We mix it with a known amount of helium three, which is the rare isotope, at least on Earth of helium, we let them mix, and then the mass spectrometer in the back just has to measure the ratios of helium 3 and 4. Because we know the amount of 3, we can back out uh, how much 4 in a total volume uh, was in our sample. So that gives us the daughter product, and you know that's uh, not in, uh, a very difficult thing to do necessarily, and we can measure the total amount of helium 3. But of course we need to get the uranium, thorium, and samarium, so the next step then is to actually dissolve the samples in uh, uh, whatever is appropriate for the mineral. Um, appetite zircon or whatever you're working on will have different things. Uh, we dissolve them and we actually run them on a, an ICPMS, an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. Instead of the types we saw yesterday, though, where there's a gas stream that helps uh, helps let in the ablated part of your of your grain, um, this is actually the exact same type of machine, but instead of uh, instead of using a laser ablation with a with a gas stream, uh, it actually just sucks up a solution puts that into a plasma, and then measures the uranium, thorium, samarium. So we, uh, we spike them, we dissolve them, and then we can measure them. And once we have all of these things, once we have the amount of helium from the packet that we heated up, the amount of uranium, thorium, samarium using a solution, ICPMS, and then apply a few corrections, then we can get a uranium, thorium, helium date. Um, the, the, right. Um, the amount of time required for each of these steps can differ based on, on minerals. And certainly, if you're interested in the technique, I encourage you all to, uh, to contact us. Um, 
But realistically, you know, to measure the helium, we're talking about, oh, it takes maybe 20 minutes by the time everything goes through. We're talking about an appetite to dissolve it and measure the uranium, thorium, and samarium. Yeah, dissolving it we, takes a few hours to dissolve a whole bunch. It takes about five minutes to measure uranium, thorium, and samarium on it. Uh, uh, the, the picking and preparing can take a long time. But actually getting a date on something like appetite isn't uh, the most time-consuming part of the process. The mineral preparation, separation, doing it right, and then getting the, the proper grains out takes a lot of time. Um, uh, this part can be rather, rather quick. Uh, but then, of course, understanding and interpreting the date is, is where you're going to spend a lot of your time. There are a few uh, special considerations, though, for the technique that I wanted to, um, I wanted to cover. Um, mainly from the perspective of kind of understanding uh, why we have to characterize the grains, and also if, if Maybe your first step might be just to try to read some helium papers and kind of try to understand what's happening, and uh, hopefully these these might help. So I'm going to cover uh, I'm going to cover a few of them. Um, three that I think are at least in my opinion some of the the bigger ones, which is the the idea of what this alpha ejection correction is, that uh, this correction I've, I've kind of alluded to, and why we have to measure the size of a crystal. I'll talk a little bit about the problem of inclusions. I'll talk then about uh, radiation damage um, and how it affects helium dates. And then I've grouped a whole bunch of other things into this other issues that I'll just kind of touch on briefly. And even in that, I've, I've left out some things. But these are the ones that I kind of think are, are some of the, the, the biggest. OK, so uh, alpha ejection. Um, <laughs> this is uh, one of the. Uh, it's relatively u uh, unique to the helium system. But what I'm showing here on the left is a cartoon of some crystal. Um, and uh, each one of these, these little uh, wagon wheel things, what it's supposed to represent is uh, some parent nucleus, a uranium, thorium, or samarium atom that's, that's in the apatite or zircon or whatever this crystal is. Um, and what the arrows are showing, and then the outer circle are showing, are the range of distances that the helium that's produced during the decay uh, will be shot, uh, essentially. When, you, when that undergoes that alpha decay event, there's a fair amount of kinetic energy that is, uh, that is released. Uh, and what that ends up doing is making the helium atom that's produced, because it's tiny, shoot somewhere on the order of about 20 microns away from, the, from its parent atom. And it can shoot in any direction. We don't know what direction it's going to shoot in. So in a two-dimensional way, the helium that's produced by decay of this parent could land anywhere on this circle, for the most part. It's about 20 microns. It can vary for a variety of things, but you get the point. So if you have a, a uranium atom that is uh, sitting 30 or 40 microns from the edge of the crystal, well, no big deal. It's just going to get redistributed. You'll have these arranged all throughout the crystal. The helium will be fine. But you can see that as the parents start to get closer and closer to the edge of a crystal, there becomes a, a very good chance, if it's sitting on the edge, it has a 50% chance, of shooting the helium outside of the apatite or zircon, whatever crystal it is you want to measure, of actually leaving the system. So that if you grind up your rock and retrieve this apatite, you're going to have some parents, but you won't actually have the daughter products that came from the system. They're gone. Maybe they're into the, the quartz grain that's next door, or maybe they're, they've escaped into the atmosphere. Who knows? But they're gone. And we call this alpha ejection. Typically. For you can you can imagine that the, this is uh, the problem of this kind of scales with the size of the crystal, right? If a if a crystal was only about 10 microns wide, well then almost all the helium is going to get shot out of it, and if it's enormous, then only a small percentage of the helium is going to get shot out of it. Um, for typical appetites that we work on, this process results in somewhere between about 10 and 30 percent of the daughter product of the helium that's produced being shot out of the crystal. Um, it turns out that for if you make a few assumptions, which there are problems with, uh, certainly, but at least for appetite, they seem to hold pretty well, you can actually make a correction for this if you know the geometry of the crystal, which is why we want to pick euhedral appetite crystals that have the crystal faces and things like that, and if you know the size of the crystal, and specifically the surface area to volume ratio of the crystal, which is why we have to measure its dimensions before we analyze it. So in our preparation, when we're, when we're selecting these really beautiful euhedral crystals and we're measuring the dimensions, it allows us to apply a geometric correction. Um, 
We have to assume things like the uranium and thorium are homogeneously distributed. That's fine. <clears throat> but we can calculate this value here, Ft, uh, which is the symbol we use to denote the alpha ejection correction. And again, this can be fairly substantial. I mean, 10 to 30% of your daughter product is huge. That's an enormous amount. Um, and uh, uh, is, is something that you definitely need to, uh, to take into consideration. Um, this is, again, standard protocol. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the problems associated with these assumptions in, in a few slides. Uh, the second thing we want to uh, avoid are inclusions. And this is particularly a problem for appetite. And I have a little cartoon to demonstrate why that is here. Here's a, a, a picture of an appetite filled with little inclusions. I have no idea what they are. But uh, let's pretend that you have an appetite uh, and it has a little zircon inclusion in it. Um, when we heat up the system with a laser, right, all of the helium is released. It doesn't matter what it's, what it's in, if it's in the appetite, if there's somehow there's some in the little zircon inclusion. It doesn't matter what it is. We heat things up to about 1,000 degrees for five or 10 minutes. We get all the gas out of it for the most part. So we get all the daughter product out. But then for appetite, what we do is we drop these guys in a, a fairly weak nitric acid and dissolve them in just a few hours. That'll dissolve appetite, no problem, but it won't touch zircon. So what you end up doing then is in the solution that you measure on the ICPMS, you have all the parent atoms from the appetite, but the ones that were in the original zircon, which you know zircon typically has a lot more uranium thorium in it, it's more concentrated than appetite by an order of magnitude or more. What you end up with then are a lot of what we call unsupported daughters. And that makes your age or your date too old or kind of unreasonably old in some cases. So uh, you leave behind and you don't measure some of these parents. And this is why when you're picking grains, um, even though there are many inclusions that won't make a difference, if it's a quartz inclusion, who cares, right? It's not going to have any uranium and thorium in it. There's a variety of other things. But we don't really know what they are necessarily. And so we have to avoid them just to be safe. And this is uh, those of you who have picked appetites in our lab know this is what you spend a, a ton of time doing, are using these uh, polarizing filters and turning off the lab lights and trying to keep things nice and dark to try to find these tiny little inclusions that, that you worry about. Those are two things that are uh, kind of analytically the two of the bigger issues, I think, for the, for the helium system. Um, <clears throat> one of the other issues is uh, something that has now been well established, which is the realization that the diffusivity of helium in minerals, uh, particularly appetite and zircon that we've constrained really well so far, but most likely all other minerals, is also strongly controlled by the amount of radiation damage that the crystal lattice has experienced or that is present in the crystal lattice. Um, so uh, in appetite, it turns out that as that radioactive decay is occurring and the crystal lattice is being damaged, that the accumulation of that radiation damage actually makes the grain more retentive to helium. So effectively, it's giving it a higher closure temperature. If you have grains that have, that have experienced some radiation damage, then they actually could be a little bit older than grains sitting right next to them that haven't experienced the same amount of radiation damage. The patterns are, are, are uh, uh, been, well, the general trend has been very well established. And uh, what it ended up, uh, what it, it's ended up doing is if you take something like this, so that what, what I'm showing on the right here is a plot of uh, helium date in millions of years uh, with, uh, with associated uncertainties, plotted versus something called mean EU. And what EU is, is it stands for the effective uranium concentration. What it is, is it's a way to combine uranium and thorium weighted for how much radiation damage they produce, basically. So it's, it's uranium plus thorium times a number. Um, what it basically means is, is that as you go to higher values, if all, these rocks came from the, if all these grains came from the same rock, as you go to higher values, the samples have experienced more radiation damage or accumulated more radiation damage. And what you can see is that the dates, the helium dates from this one sample, go somewhere from close to 20 million years old to uh, all the way up close to 60 million years old. And for a long time, when people would get dates like this back from their, their rock, they'd, they'd say, oh, great, the, the, the dates don't mean much. You know, let's, let's, let's file this away. Well, what people have now realized uh, and done some laboratory experiments to, to really confirm is that this dispersion in ages is actually geologically meaningful. And if you understand it, you can actually use it to, uh, to place even tighter constraints on the thermal histories you might be interested in.
Um, so there's actually a lot of information embedded in these things, uh, um, uh, these types of plots. Um, yes. And uh, so this is for appetite, the same has been uh, a similar process has, has been found for zircon. And there's some ongoing work on that. And there are a variety of people who are looking and observing this feature in other minerals as well and, uh, that, that, that we're working on. Um, this is probably the, the number one control, the, the number one geologic, geologically explainable control on why helium dates uh, might have a, a range in a particular sample, is the amount of radiation damage. There are a variety of other things uh, that are kind of uh, secondary, uh, in, at least in appetite specifically. Uh, for instance, you know, our alpha ejection correction assumes that uranium and thorium are evenly distributed, are homogeneous throughout the crystal. That obviously is not always true. Um, so the zonation of uranium and thorium, which are just shown here in some concentration maps, uh, can play a role. And that's certainly something that you have to take into consideration. Um, if your appetite is sitting next to a bad neighbor, uh, so something like zircon, remember, you can eject helium from the appetite, but you can also eject it from a neighboring phase into your appetite. So you can actually have helium that is there that you have no idea where the parent is. That can be a problem. Again, uh, hopefully thin section work can help you help you uh, avoid that. And in addition, there are a variety of things that can alter a grain shape that can make some of our, uh, some of our uh, corrections for alpha ejection or even our understanding of how diffusion works uh, can kind of mess with those. Uh, sometimes, for instance, when, you're, when a grain is being separated, it will break. Uh, you often, uh, appetite will, will often break uh, perpendicular to the sea plane, and you can get these little trunks out of them. But also, uh, another thing in this category could be as if you're looking at detrital grains, as they roll down a rival, river, they can also change their shape. And how that affects our alpha ejection correction and how it affects diffusivity are things we have to take into account. Uh, the fundamental here, I think it's probably reiterated by many people who've talked, is that you really do have to understand your sample uh, as best you can. <clears throat> so I showed this cartoon a little bit ago, and what it was was a cartoony way that, that uh, is kind of a, an easy way to think about thermochronology in general, which is that at high temperatures, you lose all your daughter products, so you don't calculate a date, and at low temperatures, you retain them all, and there's some transition. Um, but of course, this, like, like most simplified cartoons, isn't necessarily uh, uh, the way the world works. Um, and what we have found is that for many people, uh, helium data can be fairly difficult to understand. Um, you know, we're, again, we're not dating a, a crystallization or necessarily a specific geologic process. Um, primarily, uh, the, the problem stems from the fact that this transition from open to closed behavior doesn't necessarily happen as, at a specific point or at a specific temperature even. Um, there's actually a broad range of temperatures uh, over which helium, in this case, is either partially lost or partially retained uh, within the crystal. And I'm going to go through a few slides to kind of explain this in a little bit more detail. Um, but the fundamental thing is that a helium date doesn't necessarily reflect a geologic event, right? It doesn't necessarily reflect um, some uh, cooling event or some tectonic event or something like that. Uh, it turns out that what it is, is it's actually integrating the entire thermal history of the rock. And sometimes those thermal histories are fairly straightforward, and the helium dates are fairly straightforward to interpret. But a lot of the most interesting geologic environments have very complicated thermal histories. And so the helium dates, in this case, are, are consequently much more, uh, much more complicated. I'm going to go through a few uh, uh, kind of a, a generic explanation of why this is in discussing uh, something we call the helium partial retention zone. And then I'm going to talk about what I think are kind of the three most common ways that people try to deal with this complexity uh, when interpreting geology. <clears throat> so the helium partial retention zone is a, a, can be a slightly complicated concept, but I'm going to try to step through it a little bit. What we're looking at here is a plot where on the, uh, the y-axis we have temperature, on the x-axis, we have the percent of daughter products, in this case, helium atoms, that are retained within the crystal. So at cold temperatures, retention is at 100%. Retain them all. At uh, very high temperatures, retention is at zero. They are instantaneously diffused out of the system. They're gone, gone for good. 
But there is a broad range of temperatures. In this case for helium, it's somewhere between maybe 40-ish and 80-ish degrees Celsius, depending on a few things, where some of the helium is lost and some of it is retained. The diffusion of the helium through the crystal lattice is occurring, you know, it's fast, but it's not fast enough to instantaneously get rid of everything. <clears throat> um, and the way that this manifests itself, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, what it manifests itself in is that the helium dates that you measure are actually sensitive to the entire thermal history of the sample. So what I've shown here are three graphs, uh, and what they're showing on the, the bold lines correspond to the left y-axis, and that's temperature. The x-axis is time, so the bold lines are cooling histories. And the dotted lines are uh, helium dates as a function of time, so as they evolve. So what you can see here is that there is a, a very rapidly cooled thermal history, right? Maybe volcanic eruption or something. It's a very slowly cooled thermal history. And there's a thermal history that involves burial and reheating, and then uh, cooling off. You can see that they all start with a zero helium age. They all end up at the same temperature. And most importantly, they would all, of the, all three of these geologic thermal histories would give you the exact same helium date. It would give you an appetite date of 40 million years. And of course, we care about, you know, what we actually care about is the, is the thermal or geologic history. And that's, that's uh, kind, of, uh, kind of disturbing. Um, and more importantly, if you look at a nominal closure temperature, let's say 70 degrees, you can see that for two of these systems, crossing the 70, 70 degree isotherm, even if they got there, uh, wasn't actually a geologic event. Nothing, nothing dramatic happened at that time period. So if you were somebody who was trying to, to understand a geologic history, well, um, uh, the, that date itself of 40 million years isn't necessarily giving you anything. Again, the, the point of this is that the, the helium dates you're getting are, represent an integrated thermal history. And it's since the onset of uh, the accumulation of helium and the, uh, and the accumulation of radiation damage in a crystal. Um, so there are a variety of ways that we deal with this and that you deal with this when you're designing experiments, and we deal with this when we're trying to kind of help understand data. The first, obviously, would be additional geologic constraints. Right? Everybody goes, you know, hopefully you can go in the field. Hopefully you know the structures in the area. Uh, perhaps you have some offset uh, basalt flows that can provide a maximum constraint on the timing of faulting. Maybe you have some unconformable relationships of sediments that can help you understand when things were at the surface, when they were buried, and by how much. <clears throat> Maybe you have a variety of other systems. This is obviously the first thing to do, and these are very good constraints that we always, uh, we always hope to do. I do want to uh, just quickly, though, talk about uh, a type of data, a type of a way to understand your data that is very common in the low temperature geo uh, thermochronology world. And what this is, is using something that we call vertical sampling profiles. Um, I'm going to be using examples from the White Mountains. Uh, and it was a study that was designed to try to understand when a fault at the base of the White Mountains was active. What vertical sampling does is instead of using one single date, uh, from one rock, uh, what you do is you use a series of dates that are all part of the same structural block in a, in a simple way. So what I've shown here is some chunk of the crust. So there's depth, and this is some area of the crust. And all of these are incipient normal faults that are going to start slipping pretty soon. The dots here are, uh, are sample locations. So you can see that the samples that we're going to be eventually looking at go everywhere from near the surface all the way down to fairly deep uh, uh, you know, five kilometers or so. So cold to hot, so through the helium partial retention zone. Uh, normal faults are wonderful for thermochronology. As they slip, they bring rocks up to the surface and cool them. So what we're going to be looking at are a series of dates, then, that are all part of the same chunk of crust, all part of the same fault block, that have experienced essentially parallel thermal histories just at slightly offset temperatures. And it turns out this is actually a fairly... Uh, fairly um, powerful technique. Oh, no. <laughs> so um, in, uh, I, I think that these things are important to understand how they form. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show how they develop really quickly, and then I'll be able to finish on time, I'm sure. So if we have depth here, again, it's getting hotter as you go down. And let's just pretend that we have a whole series of samples that all have a zero age, right? And we're going we're gonna to go forward in time and see what happens to them. Uh, maybe this is a, you know, a big pile of, law, I don't know, it's probably geologically unreasonable, but they all have a zero age at this time. After 10 million years, 
right? So here's helium age on, the, on this axis. The samples that are very cool will have an age of 10 million years. They'll have been accumulating helium for 10 million years, great. The samples that are very hot and deep, though, all that helium that's been produced has just left the system. It's gone. So it'll still have an age of zero. And because of this partial retention zone, we'll have a broad swath of ages in the middle that, uh, that are reflect partial helium loss. We step, <laughs> we step to 20 million years. Again, the, the cold ages are at 20. And finally, after 40 million years, you can see that this profile in the crust would actually display, that where it had the same thermal history, would display a huge range of, in this case, apatite helium ages. So what this means then is that this partial retention zone is something that we can actually go and look for from samples like this that represent different paleo depths. Uh, these are in these little TIE fighters here in white are the, the helium dates for, for this chunk of the crust. And what you can see is that pattern that I just showed you, where you have old dates at the top, they get slightly younger, and then they, um, there's a, 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 a chunk of them here that are roughly the same age. Uh, these are fission track dates here, which I won't talk about. But what we can actually do is use the shape of this elevation profile to, to constrain the, the thermal history. I won't go into the details because I'm running out of time. But these different thermal histories I showed you earlier will actually produce different age elevation profiles. So this is a way that by planning your sampling very, very, very uh, smartly, you can actually constrain things. Um, and then finally, there's been a, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of ev uh, work recently on using helium data uh, in, in concert with a variety of other things to, uh, to put into thermal models. There are some outputs here from uh, a program called Hefty that many people use to model helium data. And what it's showing are thermal histories that are consistent with a variety of uh, inputs. Um, there are more complicated uh, thermal, historying, uh, thermal history modeling programs that use landscape evolution models in concert with these things. A variety of ways to actually try to, um, try to do that. Um, and I am going to leave it at there. Uh, and I'll take any questions that you might have.